Um, we're going to focus on the personal statement because um, um, I, I guess uh, the goal of colleagues and I uh, in HSPS when we, we, we do interviews is to try to find out what the person's really interested in and have them talk about that. No intention of getting any trick questions or anything that's surprising, really focusing on, on your interests um, as represented by the personal statement. Um, so that's what we, we're going to be uh, focusing on. Does that sound all right? Yeah, that sounds great. Okay, lovely. Um, so in your personal statement, you say that anthropologists can put on different cultural lenses as a means of exploring difference outside of what's good or bad, right or wrong. Can you tell me a bit more about what you mean by that? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think what I really love about the discipline is that it doesn't, or it tries not to reduce things down to binaries. Um, I think a big part of that is kind of the method the methodology of anthropology, um, kind of the in-depth quality, um, kind of the, eth the ethnographic quality of it, um, and the idea of kind of challenging or trying to put aside one's own cultural assumptions and move beyond that. Um, and one thing I think of is, um, you know, there are, there's some literature on gender and how in the UK and in the West we tend to take for granted um, that there's this kind of male, female, man, woman binary. Um, and in certain other parts of the world, there's ideas of third, a third gender that's just kind of normal. Um, and so I really am looking forward to being able to kind of not take things for granted, kind of take things like complexity as not an anomaly, but as the norm. Wonderful, um, thank you. Yeah. Um, um, does that mean you think that anthropologists should throw away ideas of good and bad, right and wrong? I think there is definitely a tension, um, especially because traditionally, you know, anthropology is seen as kind of a <coughs> culturally, cultural relativist position. And there's definitely a tension with that and ideas of kind of universal human rights discourse. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but I think, for example, um, Malinowski he had this idea that there are certain universal aspects of culture, but that they can be manifest differently. So like the idea of biological reproduction leads to a need for kinship systems, but that will be manifest differently. And so it's kind of accepting that there may be these universal features, but really looking at the culturally specific manifestations of things, understanding them for what they are rather than kind of importing outside perspectives um, and then I think with that, that tension between the kind of relativist and universalist position might become easier to negotiate. So why, I mean, we're talking about anthropology, but you know, what's specific about anthropology here? Um, you know, there's all kinds of different approaches that might help us think about the universal and the specific. And it sounds to me like what you're interested in is this aspect of the particularity of things. What is it about anthropological method that you think might be relevant to that? Yeah, I think, so obviously I know um, the ethnographic approach is being adopted by lots of other disciplines, um, but definitely like anthropology has that kind of, was the pioneer of that method um, and it has that rich history. Um, can, you explain, I think, ex can you explain what you, what you understand by ethnographic method? Yeah, so I, I understand it both as um, a method of doing research, but also like the product that comes out of it. So you have an ethnography. Mm -hmm. um, uh -huh. so, what, so, what, so what does an ethnography involve? What do you need to do? So it's very, my understanding is it's kind of very in-depth um, study of where the researcher kind of tries to completely immerse themselves within the group that they're studying. Mm -hmm. um, and it often like has a very holistic approach to it. So it's not necessarily, although it can be necessarily focusing on one aspect of a group or a culture but trying to kind of understand the whole and how the different parts kind of interact um, together I think like with the ethnography I think that's why I find the anthropological approach so fascinating and something I really want to study more is the kind of it's a very democratic almost approach obviously it has its historical problems um, kind of it was born in the colonial times um, and we need to be careful about that, but kind of, it's really focused on kind of relations and like relation making with the people that they're studying, rather than kind of just observing from afar and then taking away 
your own kind of conclusions from that. So I personally agree with you, but couldn't it be argued that it's really not very democratic at all? Because the ethnographer goes and they, they study the people they're studying, whether that's somewhere around the world or close to home, and then they get to write it up. Yeah. And so in your, in your personal statement, you say the anthropologist's role is as a storyteller, and that's a role that you aspire to take on. Isn't that a bit unfair or undemocratic? Yeah, definitely. I, I think um, that it, it can be. Um, and I think with any research, you know, there's an ideal of how it should be done. It doesn't always happen that way. You know, research can be quite messy. Um, I think one of the things, uh, books I read was um, The Innocent Anthropologist, and it's very much kind of um, demystifying what the research process is like and how messy it can be on the ground. Um, uh, so I think that whilst I, the idea of storytelling, it has to be true to the people that you're studying. Um, and that kind of the democratic nature, the kind of putting the, um, the people you're studying's voice center has to be, I think, um, is paramount to uh -huh. maintain that. So you, th so you think that if an anthropologist says something that the people that they are researching wouldn't agree with, that's bad anthropology, that really you have to have alignment between the account of the anthropologist and the perspectives of the people being studied or, or it's, it, 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 the method's not worked? Yeah, um, again, I think, I think it's difficult and I think that that's an issue that's not just true to anthropology, but obviously other disciplines like sociology as well is kind of this, um, you don't want to fall into um, tropes of false consciousness or cultural dupes um, and can then you can you explain what you mean? I mean that's a bit of jargon. So what do you mean? Um, so false consciousness, the idea that um, obviously it's most associated with Marx, that um, kind of we buy into an ideology and so we can't recognise our own oppression or suffering. Um, sure, but what's wrong with that? I mean, I could say that there's uh, a group of people who I've studied over years and years who. Um, are misled about some aspect of their lives. And I, as an anthropologist, can say, no, they've got false consciousness. They don't understand their lives. Something is going wrong for them. They are telling themselves a story about how it's going right. And the result is oppression. Um, what's the problem with that? Yeah, I think, I think the key is, it's important to recognize those, recognize kind of power inequalities and things that even we can't recognize ourselves. But I think the key is to understand kind of why that false consciousness or how whatever we want to term it happens yeah. uh -huh. um, and see you know there might it could be said that there are benefits for someone from for holding on to a belief that isn't the case so yeah. it's important to understand that their perspective in it right very much so um so in which case then does that imply that the anthropologist should sometimes write something that the people that they are studying disagree with if so how does this work? Should they generally be aligned? Can you say something that they disagree with in, in the exception? Uh, these are issues that are really, um, I feel them every day in my research. So I'm asking them as part of kind of like just thinking them through myself as well. I'd be really interested in your thoughts. Yeah, I think um, that as long as kind of, it's not stripping away what the people you're studying think. So it's not just writing up what you think has happened or what you know what you the kind of you see as the situation, but kind of saying this right this is happening. There may be some misrecognition here. Yeah. But this is what my participants have said. Yes. Um. Perhaps this is how they got there. Like linking up other things you've studied. As long as it's kind of you're not doing away with the participants' voice. Yes. I think is really important. Why? Because with a lot of these disciplines, especially the ones that I'm kind of drawn towards, anthropology mainly, also sociology, yeah. I think the idea of kind of using it as a way to empower people, kind of not this getting stuck in ivory towers, kind of this con connection between the academy and activism, which I know obviously can be quite a tense um, kind of alignment, but yeah. I think it's really important that we're not using our research and the discipline to disempower people. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to make sure that we don't risk disempowering the very people that we intended to empower by studying them. 
it's such a tricky thing, isn't it? Because if all we do as researchers is say, and this is what people think, mm. are we being sufficiently critical? Are we actually really offering anything that goes outside of academia? On the other hand, if we take the high road and say, well, you know, this is, you know, people are wrong. Um, what right do we have to say that? Is that a constructive thing? So this relationship between academia and other, and other audiences in my work, that's um, social workers and, and clinical psychologists and psychiatrists, you know, what right do we have to, to criticize and on what, on what basis? How do you build trust? Such crucial, crucial questions. Um, lovely reflections, thank you. Um, in your personal statement, uh, another comment that you make, it'd be lovely to pick up on, is you say that culture is smarter than individuals since it's cumulative. Um, I'd love to hear what, what you meant by that. Yeah, definitely. So I think it's important to recognise that kind of cultures persist despite individuals, you know, being born and dying. You know, they're greater than the sum of their parts. Um, so I think there's that aspect. And also that no single individual can possess the entirety of a culture. For example, no one's going to know all the laws and, you know, all the kind of institutions, it doesn't happen. I think that it's something I've been thinking a lot about in terms of um, kind of our reverence for experts. Yeah. And we forget that not no one can know everything. Um, and that's kind of how I see the distinction between culture and individuals. It's, it's cumulative, it's built up over generations um, and therefore it's kind of, it persists despite individuals. Um, Mm -hmm. And also it's learned in that, I think it goes back to the cultural glasses thing, kind of our culture is the kind of provides a framing um, for how we see things and experience. Experience isn't just given to us. It's, it's learned, it's acquired by the culture that we're kind of born into or live within. I agree with all of that, definitely. I'd be interested to see your thoughts on, on how that fits together with your claim that the anthropologist is assessing difference outside of good and bad, right and wrong. So if you have a culture that is better at, cumul at accumulating culture, that would be a culture that would be smarter from what you say. Um, would an anthropologist coming from such a culture be better able to judge the cultural artifacts, ethics, society norms of another culture that finds it more difficult or has less infrastructure um, for um, making this accumulation of culture? How does this claim that culture is smarter when it's cumulative fit with your claim that the anthropologist shouldn't really be thinking in terms of strict oppositions, mm -hmm. good, bad, right, wrong? Um, I think from my understanding of what you're saying is that that introduces again the risk that we were talking about of kind mm -hmm. of going into one culture and kind of almost like this kind of colonialist power inequalities. Yeah. You have to shed your own kind of assumptions um, in order, I think, to be able to fully understand another. I don't really um, understand. You've said that individuals kind of make sense of things, their experiences on the basis of culture. Uh, how can you shed your assumptions? I think it goes into, I mean, obviously it's never going to happen in completely, but it's just that constantly being reflexive. Um, mm -hmm. And even if, you know, we haven't shed our assumptions entirely, recognising, oh, I interpreted this way, because of my assumptions. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So one thing that I think I mentioned is about my EPQ. I, when I was doing that, I just took for granted the black white distinction that was in kind of the, the statistics. Yeah. And then in reading the Instant Anthropologist um, in, for the DeWios, the norm is not white because we have white and non-white. Yeah. It's black. So they believe that white men at night take off their white skins to reveal their real black skins. Yeah. So I think it's just being like, oh, OK, I did take something for granted. I did make an assumption, but now I'm being reflexive about it and can take that forward. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Really interesting conversation about personal statements. Um, I really uh, enjoyed that so much. Thank you. Thank you so much.